everyone, welcome. <clears throat> if we could give a uh, a Twitter space uh, blue hand and a red hand to welcome our guest, General Ryan, that'd be great. And it's always a pleasure to have you on the Walter Report in conjunction with Marie Aid, sir. Welcome. It's great to be back with you again. How's everyone going? Oh, you know, we're, uh, we're everyone's perplexed. Everyone wants to know when the war is going to end. And I said, I know just the man who will tell us. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, you know what? How about this? Dealer's choice. You're always a natural here. So instead of uh, throwing some questions at you, well, why don't you just start, like, if, you know, you're telling a friend, what's the assessment? Where are we at today with Ukraine and Russia? Let's start with that. Um, well, my assessment, and, you know, this is caveated by the fact there's a lot we don't know about what's going on in this war, clearly. Um, you know, the Donbass uh, is a pretty desperate fight for the Ukrainians. Uh, the Luhansk pocket is slowly closing and the Ukrainians have some big decisions to make about the forces that are still fighting in that pocket, even though they are slowly bleeding the, the Russians. Um, around Kharkiv, it appears to me that the Ukrainians and Russians are just steadily punching each other in the face without great changes in territory. But, you know, the Ukrainian aim is clearly to ensure the Russians can't uh, range Kharkiv with, with artillery. The south is very important and interesting. I think the advance towards Kherson, whether that is a, you know, strategic uh, counteroffensive or just local attacks that are experiencing uh, more success than expected, I think is important because it draws off Russian attention and forces, but it also gives the Ukrainians a pathway to hopefully taking back some of their ports, which strategically uh, are, are very important to Ukraine for generating their own revenue, but also for world food markets. 100%. So let's start there and go counterclockwise. Let's go to Kherson. So about two and a half weeks ago, Ukraine had conducted counter moves, and they it kind of uh, it was pretty interesting because it was a really, really good example of uh, well-executed maneuver warfare. They went on the offensive. Um, they got very close to uh, intimidating Russian logistics supply lines. And they didn't go anywhere after that. And a lot of people ask, you know, uh, why? And, and from the military military planner side of me, I thought, you know, maybe maybe, maybe it was just uh, an attempt and maybe they don't have the resources to exploit that, you know, that victory any better. Um, so what's your take on that? Why did they, they punched about a 50, 60 kilometer front through the Russian lines there. Yeah, think? my my sense is this was potentially a, an economy of force mission where, you um, whoever was uh, commanding in the south kind of pitched it to the Ukrainian high command and said, listen, I think I can um, take some ground here and I think I can, um, you know, draw off enough Russian forces from the east to make it worth our while, uh, even though, you know, the south isn't the Ukrainian main effort at the moment. So I think the Ukrainian high command said, yeah, give it a go. Uh, we can't give you a lot of support. We don't have the reserve forces you know, for some kind of operational breakthrough, but see what you can do with uh, a range of tactical counteroffensives. I think those uh, counterattacks in the south have probably uh, uh, made really good headway. Um, if that was if that was the approach, I mean, Ukraine <laughs> and the Russians are both, I think, getting fairly tired as military fighting forces. Um, you know, I would be looking at the south at the moment uh, if I was a Ukrainian high command, going well. Maybe there's some opportunity here before the Russians can rush forces in. Um, but my sense is this was an economy of force mission that's been reasonably successful for the Ukrainians. Excellent. And then moving uh, counterclockwise up to uh, Mariupol area and the land between Donbass, uh, is, that, do, are, is the condition or the state of that area uh, solely dependent on how Donbass plays out and that's why the Ukrainians' concentration of force is located there? Well, I mean, the Luhansk pocket is part of it. Um, and, you know, how long can Ukrainian forces keep the shoulders of the pocket open? Um, you know, in the north and, and the south uh, edges of that pocket that's slowly closing versus how long can they, uh, you know, fix and hold Russian forces uh, in the eastern part of the pocket? And then how long do they actually... Uh, keep fighting in there, um, understanding that they probably need to get out some of those forces because they'll be needed elsewhere. Now, uh, if the pocket does close, it will clearly shorten the Ukrainian defensive line in the east and 
um, it will be a political issue for the president because the Hansk uh, region will have been lost. But it's not the entirety of the Donbass, right? You've got large portions of Donetsk, which are still controlled by the Ukrainians, and the Russians uh, clearly have a decision to make about do they sustain their momentum in the Donbass and then continue seeking to roll over the remainder of Donetsk, or do they uh, have a pause, uh, reset, reinforce, rethink um, the balance of the operations between the east and the south? Makes sense. So Kharkiv is pretty much a standstill, so we're not, not, not to get into that. Let's talk about uh, something we discuss here quite a bit. I get some of my old professors from staff college. I'm lucky enough to get them on here. And I joke that uh, it's the first time I've had to listen to them without being paid for it. So um, <laughs> one, one of the uh, people, I'm not sure people get it, you know, non-military types are like, what does he mean? Um, so uh, I always used to, I, I always used to tell my mates uh, uh, if, if they're going on for a long time, I'd say, hey, listen, we're getting paid to be here. So just enjoy it. Um, so here's the thing. So we keep talking about the delay mobile defense, or we call it a delay specifically. And uh, I'm not a Ukrainian general, but when I look at a map, I see the controlled nature of withdrawals and, you know, it just happened to be going to pre-prepared uh, defensive battle positions were pretty neatly laid out kill zones and obstacles that shape the enemy. So this looks very well planned in my mind. And uh, a lot of a lot of smarter people like you tend to agree. Uh, today, General Zeluzhny answered probably criticisms about loss of territory. And, and what he said was, he goes, this is, this is planned. This is, you know, our, this is our mobile defense. It's a delay if you translate it from Ukraine. Um, how, com- how do you feel about that? Like, what would you say to someone who says, you know, oh, but they're losing land, even though they're losing 500, 1,000 meters a day, sometimes nothing at all. Uh, how, how effective is, is the delay? Uh, can you, I, I, I don't want to ask you to reassure people, but maybe you could speak to that as a general. Um, it would mean more from you. Uh, the delay. Yeah, I mean, this is clearly a mobile defense. Um, which is very different to um, the more static uh, designs for defence. And the Ukrainian High Command is about the strategic end state. And the strategic end state is throwing the Russians out of Ukraine. To do that in a mobile defence in particular, sometimes you have to slowly delay them to bleed them to get to the point where you can shift to the offensive and the Russians have minimal defence against your um, offensive operations. That, at the strategic level, means you have to make hard decisions about giving up land to preserve your forces, which, you know, the Ukrainian army is way more important than Ukrainian land at the moment. Like, you've got to keep that force in being so you can take back land at the end of the day. Um, so these are the kind of conversations that Ukrainian High Command will be having, that the Ukrainian High Command will be having with the President and saying, you know, Mr. President, you know, we probably need to give up this to save this force so down the track we can take back this land uh, plus plus. I think another important thing we should remember is, you know, probably most of the Ukrainian commanders at various levels, whether you're, you know, company, battalion, brigade or higher, over the last 10 years they've probably done officer training, shoots on this ground and for a lot of them, they'll be fighting over ground. You know, I remember this defensive troop from back here. I remember the different avenues of approach an adversary might take. I, I remember, you know, the different ranges of guns or where an adversary might put their reserves. So they're fighting over known ground, and they'll be doing the same when they go back on the advance. Um, we shouldn't lose sight of that. The Russians are not fighting over known ground, and that puts them at the disadvantage. Um, and, you know, at some point the Russians will be on the defensive and the Ukrainians will start pushing them back. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I liken it to uh, a live range on our base here in Canada. Imagine imagine being told now, you, now you're going to fight on the same place you've been training on for the last 10 years, right? Yeah, in their that's case, right. Eight. Yeah. So, um, and knowing the uh, ground's important. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, air, air forces and navies don't understand this, but terrain and micro-terrain in particular – can have such a profound importance, especially if you're conducting mobile defence or uh, a more manoeuvre approach where you need infiltration routes. Um, use of the terrain and micro-terrain is a really critical part of the tactical fight. It, it's a, it reminds me, but on a much larger scale, of 1973 or 67 when the Israelis were fighting the Golan Heights, uh, especially 73. They, they knew where all their runoffs, uh, run-ups were. They, 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 just, they, they, tra- they fought as they trained, literally. And in yep. this case, the Ukrainians are fighting as they literally just trained. 
Yep. So uh, what about the fact, and this is another point that we've mentioned, uh, wouldn't mind uh, supporting fires. Um, Ukra- Ukrainians are getting the reserves together. They do have the just rough numbers. They had about 700,000 reservists in the last eight years that have fought roughly in the Donbass or in the army. And they've, they've isolated maybe three to 400,000. So let's assume they're doing IBTS and they're doing, you know, combined uh, arms maneuvers in other parts of the country or Europe uh, to get up to snuff. The Russians don't have that that refill going on. They're not getting, they're not mobilizing a million people. Um, is it fair to say that as the Russians take more and more of the Donbass, they have roughly about the same amount of men to defend a much larger area now? Is that, is that true? Do you feel that's the case? And therefore, obviously, what are the implications for the counter attack? Well, I think the Russians are doing a trickle of reinforcements, you know, uh, by extending contracts, new contracts, uh, private military forces, mercenaries coming in. So they're not getting no reinforcements, but, you know, it, it'd be interesting to see the level of reinforcements. I mean, the Ukrainians, uh, obviously, this uh, figure you quote, 700,000 being mobilised, we, we all know there's there's an individual training liability there, there's a collective training liability there, um, and collective training for defensive operations um, is a simpler proposition than collective training for offensive operations. So, you know, 700,000 people being mobilised doesn't equal a 700,000-person army. There's some way to go yet. Um, for sure. And at, the, and, and at the same time, I think, you know, um, who's training these people um, and where do you have your best commanders, on the battlefield or in your training institutes? I mean, these are the kind of things I look at. This, this is a strategic force generation challenge the Ukrainians have now for the long-term fight, not the fight now, but the fight over the next next couple of years. For sure. And the 700,000 just was the number of, of, of just previously serving members. I, I, I narrowed it down to about 300,000 for, for yeah. people that could probably, you know, and that's, and that's, that's a six-month. Right. But that, 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 but no, no, that's the figure that President Zelensky also gave about, I think, about a month ago in a speech okay. he gave. He, he did mention that seven hundred thousand. Yeah, and that, that's just a t- the sum aggregate of, of pretty much anyone who's enlisted for the last eight years. Uh, yeah. So it's it's obviously a, I'm not saying it's pie in the sky, but it's obviously a, a very very generous number. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean seven hundred thousand infantrymen fighting the Russians for sure. No. It's a foundation. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, the you know. The next, the next, the next concern, uh, when you know, and and then we'll we'll hand it off to some questions here. Um, you know, when 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 Macron and Schultz and Draghi went to Kiev, uh, someone asked me, what, "What's your what's your what's your fear? What's your concern about?" And I said, "Well, my concern is that they'll dangle a carrot. I mean, some people might call it blackmail, but I'd say they'll dangle a carrot. They'll say, listen, uh, if the Russians do take all the Donbass uh, at that point.'" We want you to take that ceasefire. We will build back Ukraine bigger, better. What are the political, the ge- so on a geopolitical level, what are the political um, issues that that Zelensky and Ukraine have to deal with? Uh, should the should the Russians pull a, a ceasefire move and try to pressure the world into pressuring Ukraine? You know what I'm saying here? Yeah, no, I, I think this is an important question, and notwithstanding the statements of Macron and the German Chancellor after their visit, um, my sense is they are still going to be guided way more by domestic audiences, particularly in Germany, where there's going to be um, some significant issues with uh, energy. France doesn't quite have the same issues because of their nuclear power industry. Um, But, you know, the German domestic uh, audience is going to be the most powerful determinant of the German Chancellor's behaviour in the coming months, as Europe goes into winter, clearly demand for energy goes up. Supplies are interesting at the moment, so prices are probably going to go up. Um, you know, I think we've seen uh, French and German colours so far in this war. They've been fairly lukewarm in their support for Ukraine. Um, and I think they would quickly um, revert back to norms of trying to force some kind of accommodation on Ukraine if it's politically expedient for them. They, you know, they're not the ones physically at threat here, but the Eastern Europeans are, and you can see that they are all in here. You know, Poland in particular, but other countries, you know, um, have just, I think it's, uh, have given a, um, a guarantee uh, to, you know, secure the airspace of another country who's going to... Uh, donate fighters to Ukraine. You know, the Eastern Europeans are all in. They understand the stakes here. I think the Germans and the French still haven't really 
appreciated the stakes here. I mean, I, I don't think they've made the intellectual shift about the profound danger that countries like Russia and China pose in the 21st century. Um, they've been reading Stephen Pinker too much about the decline of war. Um, they probably need to read some other people who are a little bit more pragmatic about human conflict in the 21st century. Fair enough. No, thank you for that. And the, the weapons that have been delivered, uh, HIMARS, uh, do you think there's a critical mass that the Ukrainians are waiting for in order to receive and properly train before they conduct counter offensive or counter attack? A lot of people, that's one question people ask. When, when will the Ukrainians go on the offensive? And I think the only rational thing I can think of is when they feel that they have everything they require to do so effectively, because I don't think they're going to get very many opportunities. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, the Ukrainians have shown a pretty good a strategic decision-making approach for that at the moment. Um, you know, they were able to uh, win the Battle of Kiev and the Battle of Kharkiv. They're on the offensive now around Kherson. So when people say, when are they going on the offensive, uh, my my response would be, well, which one? I mean, they've already done three. Um, and for a country that's much smaller than Russia, uh, generally their timing of these offensives seems to me from the other side of the world to be pretty right. Um, their strategic military decision making seems to be probably better than any other country in the world at the moment. Um, they're more experienced. So, you know, I, I look at this and go, you know, the Ukrainian calls so far have been pretty good. Um, I would defer to their judgment. I mean, I, it's not for me to say, well, I'm really impatient. I wish they go on the advantage. The Ukrainian high command have demonstrated excellent decision making so far. And I think we just need to ensure that um, we sustain patience in Western polities uh, to ensure they win the war on the time frame that's appropriate to them, not the thing that's convenient to audiences in Western Europe um, or North America. Thank you. So, yeah, and, and the question specifically was related to, and this from these are from the audiences, uh, uh, to Don Bass, and, and, I, and I, I, again, like I, I echo everything you just said. Uh, they've done a great job so far. Um, and they're obviously waiting for the opportune moment. Uh, it doesn't play into European timetables. Um, but do you think that the, 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 the comments by Zaluzhny where he says, you know, basically we've got this and we know what we're doing and we're doing mm. that mobile defense. Uh, do you think that, um, that they would, let's say, uh, when, let's say they found the time right, the time was right next week and they let the Russians extend themselves and then they do something. Um, does the delivery of Western weapons have a big part to play with it? Or do you think that they would go, do you see what I'm saying? Are they wait, I guess one of the questions is, are they waiting for X number of artillery or guns and M777s or HIMARS, or all the HIMARS are there, but are they waiting for a certain number of things to come to then go for it? Or is it obviously a confluence of factors? Uh, yeah, it's, it's never as simple as one thing. Um, it will be a confluence of different considerations, everything from conditions on the ground, um, the availability of uh, ammunition in particular, not just guns, but the ammunition to support them, um, the feed of intelligence from their own sources, but also Western sources on, but potentially uh, on Russian logistics and reserves, uh, if they were to go on to the offensive. Um, and, you know, force availability, force status, uh, how tired are they, uh, what are Ukrainian operational and strategic reserves. So, you know, you guys have all been on planning staffs and, and, and done military stuff. Um, there's a whole range of different considerations that the Ukrainian High Command and the JFO will be looking at um, before they shift to an offensive. You know, it's the old metaphor about the snake putting his head out of the hole you don't, you know, kill the, try and kill the snake the first time he just pops his head out. Uh, you wait till he feels safe and is overextended and then you can chop the head off. And that's very much, I think, what the Ukrainians are doing. Um, they've shown the ability to do that so far throughout the war. And, I, I, you know, my sense is they will strike when the time is right. Amazing. So it's fair to say in some that you're confident and you're, 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 you're sufficiently impressed with Ukrainian actions so far. And that this looks like they know what they're doing. It's a, they're a controlled mobile defense. And when the time is right, they'll do what they have to do. That's fair? No, I, I, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, Peter had a question for you, sir. And then Tom, go ahead, Peter. 
Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Yehuda. Thanks to the Wall Street Report. Uh, General, our thanks uh, for joining us. Uh, General Ben Hodges has recently joined this space. Uh, he's going to join us again. He speaks very highly of you from your time together at the Pentagon. Here's my question. A lot of times we get in these situations where people take their strategic cues from the New York Times or what they read from Steven Pinkner. Uh, I've recently had my own conversations here in Washington this week where the assumption was Ukraine is losing. Now, I don't agree with that assessment, and I would really welcome your insight, because when you're at that table, when you're at that briefing, and the politicians are asking, where is our victory? You're a warrior with a lifetime of experience. If you were in this position, what would you say to American or Canadian politicians who were questioning the state of the war right now? How do you defend the resources that you need to achieve your mission? Hmm. No, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, one of the things I've seen throughout this whole conflict is there are very, very few people, politicians, even senior military leaders, unfortunately, who understand war as a phenomenon. And un- don't, they don't understand that war is all about pluses and minuses. It's about advances and reverses. It's about great victories in battles, but also setbacks. I mean, remember Dunkirk, you know, do you want to win a battle or do you actually want to win the war? Do you want to have a tactical approach or do you want to be truly strategic and think through the huge number of interconnected tactical, operational, strategic and political events that need to come together to beat the Russians and expel them from Ukraine? I think the vast majority of people uh, who you know, don't understand war as a phenomenon. We look at it at a 24-7 news cycle, war porn kind of approach, you know, see a reverse and think it's all over. Those of us who have studied this deeply for decades understand, no, this is just something that happens. This is quite normal. It's the larger picture, the political and strategic you have to pay attention to. And unfortunately, most people in government, even in militaries, but in the general population, don't have the patience or knowledge to do that. Ukraine is not losing. They are in a very, very tough fight in Donbass, as they were in a very, very tough fight north of Kiev and north of Kharkiv. Strategic patience is the order of the day. They have demonstrated the operational, strategic and political capacity to fight and win, and I have the confidence that they can continue to do that. Now, The one caveat I'd put on that is Russia's strategic warfare, which is about cutting off Ukrainian sources of revenue and the ports for them to export goods. That is something that would be, I imagine, of deep concern to the Ukrainian government, but also to European leaders because its impact on world food market. So the South, I think, is an area where we may see a lot more attention and a lot more pressure uh, to secure back territory and particularly ports so the Ukrainians can at least start exporting stuff. Now, clearly that doesn't address uh, Russian naval blockades in uh, the Black Sea, and there's going to have to be something done there in the EU and NATO, I think. You know, this is not over. The Ukrainians have not lost. The Ukrainians are not losing. And, you know, the prospects, I think, for them are reasonably positive. Thank you, General. Thank you for the question. Over to Tom. Tom's a resident psychologist from uh, UK. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, Good evening, guys, and uh, thanks for joining us, General. I just wondered if you could put some ballpark figures on, like, Russian troop numbers in terms of how many men they may actually have invaded with in February 24th. Uh, how many they may have had left or reinforced with before they went on the offensive in the East, and how many they might have left now. And and then finally, how long it might be until they kind of end up culminating in the East. Um, That's a pretty hard question. And uh, frankly, I think even intelligence agencies have problems with that. In fact, I probably think the Russian command have problems with understanding how many soldiers they have in the field at any one time. I mean, I can only go with the open source, you know, estimates that we saw on the borders around Ukraine, which, you know, put it at somewhere between 150 and 200,000. 
which is a very, very small force when it comes to invading and, and wanting to conquer a, a country of 44 million. You know, I, I think at the moment in the Donbass, you're probably probably seeing no more than half of that that's available for a range of reasons. Uh, but that's still, a, for the Donbass, that's a significant force. Now, casualty figures will whittle that down in their combat losses or just the day-to-day losses you, you suffer in every military organisation in the world. When will they culminate? Well, I, you know, I'm not in the position to put a date on it. You can't predict what's going to happen in war. But, you know, for me, if you have a look at historic warfare, particularly over the last 100 years, these things generally have a pattern where there are pulses of combat followed by periods of much, much lower tempo, not zero tempo, but much, much lower tempo. I think we're getting towards a period where this current pulse of combat in the Donbass and more largely the initial pulse of combat from 24 February is starting to come to an end, is starting to ease off. And I think the key moment that might determine that will be if the Russians close the Luhansk pocket and secure the remainder of that province. That could be days, that could be weeks, but my sense is probably not more than a couple of months because both sides have been fighting really hard, sustaining casualties, going through material and ammunitions at a significant rate, and they're probably going to have to have a lower tempo period to reinforce, restock, and rethink the next phase of this war. Okay, thank you. Well, first, uh, before we go on, I just want to do a bit of housekeeping. <clears throat> I wanted to, everyone to congratulate General Ryan. He's, uh, he is now Moscow famous. He's been sanctioned, so that's no more summer holidays on the Caspian, sir. Uh, I'm you're heartbroken. Gonna, you're going to have to hold on to those rubles. You won't be allowed to use yeah. them. Um, so you, you join a, a, li- a list of distinguished people, including some of my colleagues who have been sanctioned by Russia. I'm sure you're not losing too much sleep in Australia over that. Um, <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's a badge of honor, mate. I was proud to make the list. <laughs> so, and having said that, for our new listeners, if you could please go ahead and follow and check out General Ryan's profile. He's, a, he's not just <clears throat> a retired general. He's also an author and a strategist. Uh, a lot of useful information on his Twitter feed and, and, uh, and related links. Please uh, show him uh, some love from the room. And, uh, and please go check him out. We always appreciate when he's here. And while you're at it, please retweet the space. Uh, let, let people know we're here talking to General Ryan about what's going on in Ukraine, in Ukraine today, uh, the implications for the future. So we really appreciate that. And uh, again, please uh, retweet it. And congratulations on making the good guy list. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a weird way to congratulate someone, but hey, uh, I'd take it too if it was me. Um, Go ahead. We're going to go with Axel, uh, one of our moderators. So you remember him from the past. German yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Hi, Axel. Cheers. Good morning from Tallinn, General Ryan. It's a pleasure. Last time we spoke, we had the parting shot on the F-18s, and uh, whilst you couldn't promise bringing them here, uh, what is happening with that wonderful transaction? Is, is there anything going on with this U.S. leasing company being sold, and why can't we get them? Uh, it's a it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I obviously the F-18s, which are sourced from the United States, would need U.S. government approval to be transferred to to another user. You know, and the U.S. I think at least until this point has demonstrated a reticence to transfer advanced combat aircraft to Ukraine for what whatever reasons they give. I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I'm just stating it as a fact at, at this point in time. You know, my sense is the time to uh, do a re-equip of the Ukrainian uh, Air Force might be once we see a lower tempo period in the war, this likely pause we might see after after Luhansk, because we're, we're already seeing a transition to NATO equipment on the ground, and that's difficult, right? And there'll be lessons from that, particularly in the logistics side of things, that will hopefully might provide a knowledge foundation for a next phase that might see a re-equipping of the Ukrainian Air Force with standard NATO combat aircraft, whether they're F-18s or F-16s or Eurofighters or Mirages or, you know, they all kind of have a a NATO approach for design and, and logistics support. So, you know, I don't think you'll see anything in the in the short term, but you could see potentially something in the medium term 
re-equipping of the Ukrainian Air Force with a more NATO-oriented munitions and aircraft inventory. No, I, I, I agree with that. And thank you. I mean, the reason why I posed the question today was not just to have a little quip at, at our last conversation, but rather than reflecting what came out through today, I mean, there was, well, actually within the last 24 hours, the administration uh, in the US um, posted another 500 million, uh, stated that they would go for long range solutions uh, alongside the high mass, more high mass capacity. That would be my next question. But also highlighting that the um, proposal in Congress to train Ukrainian pilots on their F-15s and F-16s should go along and uh, should be promoted under the land lease. If that's the case, uh, the F-18s are definitely the most capable and most sensible platform to use for the purposes of suppression. Um, you know, I, I think there's a range of different modern fighter aircraft, you know, Gen 4, 4.5, uh, that would uh, meet Ukrainian needs. I mean, cl- clearly, you know, the ground attack role and generating air superiority, those those two roles are, are different and, you know, aircraft have different systems for each and there's different air land integration and, and integrated air defence considerations for those. I mean, you know, I look at the F-15, the F-16, the F-18, Eurofighter in particular, and you go probably all four of those, you know, maybe even the Gripen, uh, will fit some of those roles. There may not be one aircraft that meets all their requirements. So, you know, you could see a mix of F-16s or F-18s or F-15s or Gripens or whatever in the Ukrainian Air Force uh, over time. But, you know, clearly you, you don't want to be introducing multiple aircraft at the same time, but you might see different aircraft with different functions eventually in the Ukrainian Air Force. Would we be providing those without giving them Patriot batteries as well? Well, you know, you know, the design of an integrated air defence system is an extraordinarily complex thing. You know, it's it's about sensors, it's about missile systems, it's about electronic warfare, it's about the range of different combat and support aircraft, that, and then it's about the people within that system as well. Patriot is a potential part of that system. Not aware of any integrated air defence systems, the cool parts Soviet and NATO components, although, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on that, but generally these are two very separate design philosophies and technologies. So Patriot might have to be part of the solution at some point, but when that is and what its priority might be within the other aspects of an integrated air defence system is, you know, something for the Ukrainian High Command and the Americans and NATO to work through. Excellent. Thank you for that. Axel, is there a follow-up? I would have gone gone for the Atacams, but... uh... Um, I'm just wondering about the HIMARS system and whether they are going yeah, to be the only Gimlers or Atacams. But... Well, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, the way I look at this is, whilst I appreciate, you know, some of the concerns expressed by the administration and this notion of escalation, which I think is a bit of a furphy, to be quite, to be quite frank. I mean, the the base oh, round for HIMARS, high, high well, that's right. You know, the base ramp for HIMARS already gives you about 80 kilometres, which is well in advance of their current uh, MLRS systems and Russian MLRS systems in the broad. But it wouldn't hurt for the Ukrainians to hold at risk deeper targets in Russia as part of horizontal escalation. I don't see this as vertical escalation. This would just be horizontal escalation. The Russians have to know they can be hurt, and I don't think they've learnt that enough at the moment. It kind of it, it dovetails into what Colonel Vinden was saying uh, the last time that, that he sees obviously that all of the the gifting of wonderful toys is incremental and it will go short to medium to long. And that's what we've seen throughout the entire uh, conflict. So perhaps, you know, give it a give it a few weeks and, and we'll get those uh, they'll get those longer range uh, HIMARS. Mm. Yeah, the Atakams is clearly a great missile, but there's, you know, there's follow on systems even after that. Uh, that the US Army are working on, quite interesting, although the priority for production will be the Indo-Pacific, clearly, to start off with, I think. 
you know, away Tackums and, and the shorter range Highmar rounds, I would have thought there are large war stocks of those in both Europe and the United States that might be made available. All right, would you mind if, uh, Yehuda, would, would you allow me one more question then? When you, when you say uh, the, the Atacums could be delivered, wouldn't that actually change the way the Ukrainians can pinpoint and uh, therefore eradicate supply positions, rail yards, rail junctions, the supply lines of the Russians, and go into deep strike mode, eradicate those bigger maintenance yards they have established for their tanks and their artilleries? That could very well be game changing, could it not? Uh, absolutely. You know, the deep fight is an important part of warfare. But it also would allow them to have a, a battery that's firing ATACMs just outside Kiev to be able to target Russians anywhere in Ukraine. So it's not just about um, being able to strike deep into Russia. It's being able to provide coverage anywhere in Ukraine in a very responsive fashion. Now, ATACMs is a very expensive system and you wouldn't be using it without due consideration. But, you know, having the capacity from one location to be able to cover the entirety of your nation would be an interesting capacity as well. All right. Well, let's switch gears for a quick second. It's something that's come up a bit, and that is what's going on um, with Lithuania. Uh, obviously, the decision to do the sanctions, uh, was uh, in, that, that decision was made months ago. Uh, there was a timeline, phase timeline for the sanctions to come out. However, not everyone is very happy about that, including Russia. They've made a lot of hay about it. Uh, threatening severe consequences. Um, they uh, violated Estonian airspace. What threat does Russia pose to Lithuania or the Baltics? Is it bluster, rhetoric? Um, what, what, what do you have to like, Does anyone have to worry? Does the, the battle group in Latvia have to, have to mobilize, you know, notice to move? Uh, anything? Well, I think, uh, as the Russians have shown, they're not all bluster. Uh, they're willing to act uh, on their threats. They've done that in Ukraine. They certainly did it in other areas, Georgia, um, uh, Crimea and those kind of things. So uh, we shouldn't be seeing these as empty threats or bluff from the Russians. Uh, however, their capacity to do something about it at the moment would have to be looked at carefully. And on the other side of things, you know, NATO is in the game of deterrence, right? It is in the game of deterring Russian aggression. And that part of the deployment of these battle groups into the Baltics has been about deterring Russian actions. So, you know, continuing to provide support to those deployed battle groups about exercising so they're seen, about talking about the consequences of crossing that tripwire will be important parts of NATO's deterrent posture at the moment. There shouldn't be assumption that the Russians wouldn't go into the Baltics. There should be an assumption that they could, and we need to do everything possible uh, to deter the Russians from thinking that is a viable option. It's a question I've always had, just knowing about our, 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 our mission in Latvia. Um, a few of my, one of my former boss and colleague is now uh, going to be the J3 over there. And I, I was always wondering, uh, haven't been there uh, yet, but if the Russians did do something, are, are we prepared? I mean, does that battle group? I mean, now judging how they've underwhelmed us in other places, um, the battle group can't compare it to the Ukrainian army in its composition, uh, the, the disposition. Um, what, what could we do if something? If they did do something, could we do anything? Well, I mean, it's not. I mean, unfortunately for the battle group, you know, they they might, they might have a short lifespan. Uh, but the reality is uh, if the Russians do go into the Baltics, they're picking a fight not just with those countries but also the countries that have battle groups there. You know, uh, there's a multitude of countries that have contributed to these battle groups. So they would have to think it's not just about a battle group. What's the country that battle group comes from? And, you know, the Russians are having trouble with one country at the moment if all of a sudden the Russians cross the Rubicon and decide we're going to uh, go into the Baltics and we don't care if we kill a bunch of Canadians, Brits, Americans, Germans, French, whoever else is contributing to those battle groups, they're actually now picking a fight with wider NATO, uh, which NATO has been very cautious about you know, wanting to get into, but they won't have a choice. Does Russia really want to fight NATO? That's kind of the question you'd have to ponder about any entry into the Baltics. 
Okay, great. And uh, we're going to take another question from the audience. Uh, Cajun had a question for you, sir. Hi, Dave. Uh, General, thank you for joining the space. Uh, always appreciate your your, uh, your comments and your, your knowledge. Uh, my question is, um, there has been various RAND studies, various studies on the Russian military that they have great difficulty operating 90 miles from a railhead. And this success, uh, if you look at the uh, Russians' attempts in uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, when they had these multi-axis attacks from Kiev and up uh, into Kherson, moving towards Mykolaiv, and then attempting to encircle Kharkiv and push from Kar uh, from Sumy all the way to Kiev, all these uh, offensives just ran out of steam as they got further and further away from from Russian rail lines. And it seems to me that the success that the Russians are having in the Donbass area, while it's certainly some of that is attributed to the fact that they have uh, focused, highly focused their, their uh, efforts in a very small area, that area also happens to be where Russian, Russia has been building out its rail infrastructure and supply lines for the last eight years. It's, it's the one area where they have the most rail infrastructure to support their military. How is, does Russia expect to succeed in a, uh, a country that's hundreds of miles or a thousand miles wide when they can't operate 90 miles past a, uh, a rail line with any consistency? That's, that's troubling to me. And I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how Russians do that? But remember, they're a continental army. This isn't uh, an army that's designed to deploy large-scale forces across wide bodies of water and then operate, say, like the US Army is or, or other armies that we might see. So from a Russian perspective, this reliance on railways uh, makes eminent sense if there's railways. You know, the logic of attacking into Europe you know, during the Cold War, it was partially predicated on these railways all the way through. So I don't know whether the reliance on railways in a continental strategy is that big a deal, as long as you can keep the railways going. And as we've seen from the Russians, you know, these armoured trains that have helicopter escorts and have troops on board and anti-aircraft systems is part of how they are keeping their logistics working. You know, think back to Afghanistan. We didn't have trains, but we had a lot of trucks and we were doing exactly the same thing. I'm sure, you know, the Afghans are looking at us going, why are you putting these outposts in places where you only have to support them with truck convoys that are going to get attacked? The Russians have some of the similar problems, but this is just part of warfare, right? You've got to uh, undertake logistics. You've got to protect your logistics. It's just that the Russians do it with trains and we in the West generally do it with trucks. Okay, great. Uh, hope that answers the question, and uh, we're going to go to Joseph. We'll go to Joseph. Uh, I guess I, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the Russian high command in terms of. It seems like you know I haven't been keeping up on their movements lately, but in the earlier phases of the war, there were periods where it was like, okay, this new guy's in charge. You know, he's going to fix all the problems and and you know do do this, or he's going to have a new strategy that's going to fix things. And it doesn't seem to ever truly materialize. So I guess. Just uh, from your perspective, operating at that level, you know, do you have any thoughts into how coherent the high command is and, and kind of what's going on up there? Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, you're talking about the Russian high command, not yes. the Ukrainian high command? Yeah. yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, the Russian, you got the high command of Moscow, then you, you have your, your military districts, and, and clearly at the start of the war, the different military districts were fighting different wars in different parts of Ukraine. You know, I, my sense is they've learned to have a more unified approach. The appointment of Dornikov clearly uh, was about a more unified uh, Russian approach, not just between military districts, but between the different domains, particularly ground and air. Now, you can argue they've had a little bit of success in that, but not a huge amount of success. And the rumours from Bellingcat and others about the replacement of Dornikov will leave for another uh, forum. But... You know, the Russians, how they fought in Ukraine isn't really representative of their doctrine. And that goes back to the original sin of the bad assumptions they made about 
the, uh, the Ukrainians fighting like they did in 2014, that they would be a walkover, and they didn't really think through a medium to long-term war that would require concentration of effort, unity of effort, um, good logistics, and, and all the kind of things that is actually part of uh, Russian doctrine. So, you know, I think what we're seeing at the moment is a transition from political intelligence leadership of the war to military leadership of the war uh, on the Russian side. And Michael Kaufman's actually spoken about this. You know, I think you'll see a more coherent military effort moving forward. All right, thank you. Would you say that uh, a lot of the Russians' misfortune at the beginning of the war was due to the fact that these generals were acting independently? As you just said, they're fighting their own war. Were they operating in silos? Although I think they were certainly acting without a coherent, unified plan, uh, mainly because it was just, you know, get to Kiev, get to Kharkiv, uh, get to Mariupol, you know, get that done in two to three days, have a parade, and then we'll see how we go from there. Seems to have been the plan the FSB and Putin cooked up. You know, anyone who knows anything about warfare appreciates just how insane that is. But uh, when you're operating in the kind of... Uh, echo chamber that some of them are in Moscow. You can see the, how that happens. So, from a uh, for all of those uh, you know, officers on on advanced army operations courses, combined warfare courses, uh, we get told by our DS, and I remember because it was recent. Uh, you know, this is this is what this is Russian. This is the doctrine. You know, when we're war gaming, we're making our estimate. We consider what the Russians will do. This will be their screen. This will be comprised of. This is how they're they're. Yeah. Divisional group, um, and 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 just for me because you know again I'm not a general, uh, but um, I'm looking at it going from the day from day one, looking at it going, huh, this doesn't look like anything I've read. So what's going on here? Is the doctrine wrong, or are they not doing their doctrine? I think they just uh, they're not doing their doctrine, and, and I think this is a point that experts, um, you know, have made who have followed the Russians and, and looked at the Russians closely over many years, is they actually haven't um, fought like they've trained. Um, this was a rush to city, you know, barrel down the highway, take over the city quickly and easily, have a grand victory parade, um, project to the world that we've won. It's not worth interfering with this. This is a Russian affair, not a European affair. So, you know... Um, you ignore your own doctrine at your peril, um, and we've all seen military institutions do that. Um, and the, the Russians are just the latest example of a military that had good doctrine but refused to use it because it wasn't convenient for them. So do you think their their subsequent failures are also just a result of they, they, it was very hard to disengage to then start again and do their doctrine right? Because it doesn't seem they've ever really rejigged it properly, no? No, I think... Um, the Donbass is probably an indication they're slowly shifting towards using their doctrine, you know, a firepower heavy approach, those kind of things. But, you know, it just, once you're committed, I mean, we all know what it's like. Once you're decisively committed, and they were north of Kiev, um, you know, they didn't hold a lot back. It's very difficult to disengage with an enemy um, and then rethink, recock, reposture, reorient, redo your logistics, redo your fire support, your air support and then begin over. There's, you don't get a lot of do-overs in you um, unless no, you no have millions. a lot. You, you, don't, you don't have a long time. I mean, you know, you have, once again, you go back to World War II, you know, the Allies were lucky. We got a do-over. Um, you know, Dunkirk and that whole thing was a disaster. North Africa uh, wasn't great, but we won. But we got a do-over with Cilic uh, Sicily and D-Day, um, and that was a demonstration of strategic and institutional learning throughout the war. Um, and, the, you know, the force that went ashore from Canada, the UK, the United States uh, in June 1944 didn't exist two years before. It thought differently, was equipped differently, it fought, you know, fought differently. So, you know, unless the Russians have a really long time, as in years, to reset and rethink their culture, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to, for them to do a full reset. The Ukrainians themselves took eight years after 2014, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and they're still in that process. I mean, uh, I think even Ukrainians would say they've come a long way, but it's an incomplete process. 
Yeah, 100%. We're going to go to Raver real quick with a short question, and then we're going to go over to Chuck. So go ahead, Raver. Hey, good evening, sir. Uh, so your grandfather's uh, really set the tone for Australian military history in battles like the Somme that we're coming up on the 108th anniversary of. Right now, the Russians are firing up to 60,000 artillery shells a day into the Donbass. What lessons do you think they are learning about dealing with massed fires? Um, you know, there's, there's a couple things here with, with mass fires. Um, firstly is just the planning and coordination of uh, large-scale fires is something we haven't done for a very long time. I mean, clearly the initial phases of the Iraq invasions, 03, uh, 91, um, did do that. But, you know, that's a long time ago. And the knowledge of those kind of things leaves military institutions with every posting cycle. Um, so we've forgotten institutionally how to do it. Fortunately, we still have doctrine, um, and we can go back to that. So the coordination of mass fires, the prioritisation, um, the layering of it is something that we across the West need to relearn. Now, behind that, obviously, is the production of ammunition. That's not something we do. You know, a lot of countries don't even make their own ammunition anymore. They have to import it. So it's supposed to the military use coordination of mass fires is something we need to relearn, but also the industrial scale production of uh, ammunition and other consumables that we also need to get back in the game of. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to go to John Howarth. He's a uh, military researcher. Go ahead, John. Hello, sir. Um, how critical is the provision of Western-made main battle tanks to a successful counteroffensive? Oh, I think we're going to have to at some point. There's only so many advanced, upgraded Soviet-era tanks around the place. I mean, the Poles and others have been just magnificent in the uh, transfer of uh, these systems. But, at, you know, at some point, attrition, uh, just, you know, we all know armoured vehicles wear out um, through use. They break down and these kind of things. So, you know, just as the Ukrainians have transitioned their artillery systems to a more NATO-centric approach with both the equipment and the munitions, I think armoured vehicles are going to have to go the same. We're, you know, we're already seeing uh, APCs be transferred, whether it's the Australians, the Dutch, the Americans, transferring different variants of M113s. I think the next logical step has to be main battle tanks. And, you know, uh, you know Leopard 2 would be a great uh, option, as would uh, M1. I don't know how many Challengers, Challenger 2s the, the Brits have in stocks or even Challenger 1s. But, um, you know, these are the kind of systems that are... Uh, qualitatively better than the Soviet designs. We've seen that. There are NATO logistic systems at various levels to support them, as well as the ammunition natures that come with them. So, you know, my sense is at some point uh, there will have to be a re-equipment of the Ukrainian military with Western armoured vehicles, including tanks, uh, for them to really go on the offensive against the Russians. I hope that answers it. Uh, sir, I want to introduce you to a, a good friend of our room, a good friend of mine now. Uh, his name's Chuck Fur. Um, you, uh, do you know, do you remember the hijacking of the Achille Laurel? Absolutely. Do you remember the, the gentleman in a wheelchair murdered Leon Klinghoffer? Yes, no, uh, remember it. Uh, growing up, I remember that very clearly. Right. Well, Chuck had the pleasure of meeting the murderer uh, of that, uh, uh hijacking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a I don't former, think, he's a I former don't, Navy SEAL. Yeah, I right. don't. I, I don't think uh, Mr. Abbas really cared for the circumstances of our meeting, but uh, I was very glad to meet him. He wasn't so happy to see me. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, um, I, I'm glad you had that opportunity, <laughs> General Ryan. It's good to it's good to meet you, and uh, he is a good good friend, and uh, a friend a friend of his is a friend of mine. So good, good to talk to you, sir. It's great to talk to you. We we were just talking about you. Uh, the, uh, we're doing an update on Ukraine and the overall big picture, Chuck. Uh, I, I know he's uh, General Chuck's dialed into a lot of what's going on on the ground. Uh, he's also an, uh, an author as well, and uh, he spent the last thirty years writing. Uh, and obviously, he has a pretty um, uh, 
special uh, history with the Navy SEALs. Um, he said that one day I might get a coin. Uh, it might say Navy Walrus, but uh, <laughs> not, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not in the best shape anymore, sir. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to introduce you to you. And, uh, and, you Thank know, you. It's great to meet you, Chuck. Great to meet you, sir. Uh, yeah, so if there's a question here, Chuck, we were, I, I know you just popped in. Uh, we, we were talking about, I kind of want to dial it, change gears a bit again. We were talking a lot about, um, you know, uh, perhaps uh, the strategic and geopolitical misinformation. Russian misinformation, disinformation campaigns increase. We're seeing an increasing number of, of people buying into that propaganda. Uh, what, what, how do you feel? Like Chuck, Chuck's got a, a history in the, in the PSYOP side, and I know it's important to him. How do you feel? this will affect uh, the West. I mean, not to get into, you know, um, election tampering and whatever the Russians do, but is this something that we should fear? Is this, is this, is this only going to make our resolve uh, un- disunited? Oh, absolutely. We, we really have to be on our guard for this, mainly because we've got an example of the positive. You know, the Ukrainians have been magnificent in influencing many aspects, m- many parts of the world to support them. Uh, we should also assume that uh, more malign actors could undertake influence campaigns to achieve exactly the opposite in the same populations. Now, that is worst case, but, uh, you know, it's very possible, particularly as inflation rises, we're seeing interest rate rise in most countries that are supporting Ukraine, we're seeing fuel, food, other staples go up. You know, the situation is ripe for a malign actor, Russia or China in particular, to undertake a really conservative campaign to counter Ukraine's global influence operations. We have to be on our guard for that. Uh, We have to attack the source of these, whether it's troll farms, social media influences at their source to ensure they aren't able to spread disinformation because we know Lies spread faster than truth uh, in the global, especially social media uh, environment. So we absolutely must be on our guard for disinformation that will dissuade Western populations from their support of Ukraine in the medium to long term. Thank you. Uh, just, I want to pause at one question, if you could think of it as the last answer you give before you go today. That is, yep. uh, we do ask it a lot. Uh, we won't be, we won't, we, I don't want to answer it now because we'll go to CJ, but what does... um. What does a Ukrainian victory look like to you? Uh, just park that for a second, because uh, it's one of those it's one of those questions that almost we get unanimous consent from people in the audience. And in the meantime, we're going to go to CJ. I think you met him before. CJ is our resident artillery officer, and he's also something. Uh, uh, he's apparently also a, a ranger. Ranger, sorry, I, I don't know if you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love to tease him. Uh, CJ had a question for you about artillery, sir. Yes, sir. So great to speak to you. You know, we're, we're so fortunate to have countries like, you know, the U.S., Australia, U.K. that have provided both weapons and training for Ukrainians. But earlier in the space, we were talking about New Zealand and how they've provided trainers uh, for artillery for the fight. And we were discussing that previously. But this might be a policy opportunity for countries that don't feel, you know, safe or secure sending their most vital equipment, but they could uh, be willing to send more trainers, whether it be uh, in Germany or somewhere else. So I guess my question for you, sir, is how can we ensure either for basic military training or for more advanced skills training uh, to create more opportunities for Ukrainians to learn to fight, uh, maybe in a scenario or a situation where they're not under constant threat of ballistic missiles? Is this yeah. a possibility we could explore more to uh, help if we can't give them necessarily more rockets and more artillery? Yeah, no, I, no listen, I think this is a, a really important issue. I mean, 700,000 people be trained is a massive, a massive task. And to be quite frank, most Western militaries uh, are not designed anymore for mass throughput. We're designed for exquisitely trained, small professional forces. So, one, we should be helping Ukraine mobilise and train a large force, but at the same time using that to relook at our own training and education systems to see how we might be able to scale them up to counter threats from Russia, China and others in, in the coming decade. Um, you know, now, geographically, you could do it in Western Ukraine or, or Western Europe, but my sense is the Ukrainians will probably need help with raising of their next generation army that will be needed for the next year or two. 
just because of the pressures on the force in being particularly NCOs and officers to provide good combat leadership. You know, it's a great task. You know, it's the kind of thing as a former DG uh, trade-off for the Australian Army, I look at and go, man, that would be an awesome task to get your teeth into that one. But, you know, they have a problem. They, they are having to build a larger force, train it and make it effective whilst at the same time employing their current force. CJ, any follow-up for Chuck? No, I just want to say thank you so much for that answer, sir. You know, this is something I think we should look more at, and we're just so thankful that, you know, Australia has given so much already. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll uh, see Ukrainian victory in the coming months yeah. or hopefully not yeah. more than that. And hopefully we uh, we can give more. Hey, I've got time for one more question before I head off, guys. Okay. So uh, we'll go to uh, John. Uh, what's the question, John? Uh, thank you, Yuda, and thank you, Major uh, Major General Ryan, for joining us. I wanted to ask you about um, uh, the Russians' ability to interdict Ukrainian ground lines of communication and supply routes via the application of massed fires, um, as we've seen in a number of areas, particularly around, you know, Bakhmut, Lysychansk, that salient. The Russians, they've been able to push up relatively close to some of these main highways, but they have not actually been able to capture them. The best they've been able to do is bring them within fires range and just, you know, hit them repeatedly. You know, how viable a strategy is that for the Russians to try and sit there, you know, 10 kilometers, you know, 10, 20 kilometers back and just try and pound Ukrainian logistical lines to interdict their supply throughput? Is that a viable strategy for them? Well, it depends what kind of targets they're going after. You know, long-range systems are very expensive and uh, a very perishable commodity in a war like this. Um, you know, they interdicting uh, railways and roads, probably not viable, to be quite frank. But, you know, uh, attacking major logistic hubs might be. So from a military perspective, we want to go after high-value targets. But remember, these strikes with long-range systems aren't just about military utility. They're about psychological operations saying to the Ukrainians, we can attack you wherever we want, whenever we want. Um, even though the military utility of those may be may be less uh, than uh, hopeful. Hope that answers it. I um, we'll get back to the what does victory look like. I know you got to go, sir. Uh, but I thank you for for joining us. Uh, maybe the next time you're here, uh, what does a Ukrainian victory look like? Would be a, a question people would like to answer to. Yep, no worries. Happy happy thank to you. do that. Thanks for having me today. Well, thank you. And for everyone, that's General Ryan McRyan, uh, retired Australian general, and he's an author. Please check out his, uh, his, his Twitter page and, and associated links. Thank you so much. Please, whenever you do have a free moment and you'd like to chat with us, please, you're welcome at any time. No worries at all. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Good day. Cheers. Thank you, General. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. So that was uh, an amazing – thank you. Uh, an amazing uh, uh, interview again, and uh, it wasn't an interview. It's friends talking amongst friends about Ukraine, and it's always a pleasure to have such esteemed guests who uh, bring a bevy of knowledge and experience to the table. Um, and uh, it's uh, thank you again to the panel for all those excellent questions.